Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to New Books in Early Modern History, a podcast on the New Books Network. I'm Yana Byers, your host, and I'm here today with Timothy McCall, professor of art history at Villanova University, to talk about his recent book, Making the Renaissance Man, just out this year, 2023, with Reaction Books. Hi, Tim. How are you? I am awesome. Thank you, Yana. I'm very excited to be here to talk about the, the, the book, Making the Renaissance Man. This will be fun. I'm, I'm really happy to talk to you as well. How is things in Philadelphia? Closing up the semester? Just finished the semester, waiting for final exams. It's freezing, um, but I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. It, we're about to go into the holidays, and I am ready. It's been a semester. Yeah, I I um I don't know how people I I can only work on a semester. Like I can go maybe it's just because semesters are so full on, but like after the end of it I need a break. Like, I'm ready for my break. Yeah. Yes. And I'll, yeah. Maybe it's cuz I don't know anyone who doesn't any professors who don't who work less than say 70 hours a week during the semester. Maybe that's it. That sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's get to the book. Our first task is to situate this book kind of in your intellectual trajectory. And it seems a natural step from uh, your brilliant bodies, fashioning courtly men in Renaissance, early Renaissance Italy, which is Penn State Press 2022. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I would say that uh, this book definitely builds off that book from uh, about a year and a half ago, Brilliant Bodies with Penn State. That book sort of explored clothing, adornment, display also of elite men in the 15th century in, in Italy. Um, and the, the title Brilliance comes from the, it relates to the fact that I, in that book, I examine qualities of light, splendor, glamour, luster, polish, all of those things embodied through brocades and shiny silks and glittering gems, blonde hair, fair faces. All of, it's also a critical sort of investigation of whiteness and of um, aristocratic status and how it's, how it's displayed and how, you're thinking also about sort of male spectacle, men on display, men meant to be looked at, peacocks rather than penguins, I always say, um, and historicizing men's fashion um, and men's relations to uh, fashion's relations to bodies also. So there's a, I emphasize, there's a big emphasis on like legs, for instance, and the way that they were culturally legibility that men had beautiful legs in this period. And that's how, you know, that that's where people's gazes looked. Um, and so this book really, Making the Renaissance Man, takes it up from there. It's for a broader audience, um, and it also, but it investigates performances of elite masculinity also. So this is all about status, you know. The, t- the 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 title foregrounds gender, but this is equally or is more about sort of class and status. Um, and the book explores what sort of what noblemen loved in the Renaissance, how they performed, how they demonstrated virility and dominance. So it's things through through hunting through flaunting their mistresses, who are often young girls, through, through jou- and we can talk about that, through jousting. Um, and it also investigates, I'd say, historical configurations of, of sexuality, particularly heterosexuality, trying to put some pressure on it, on that, that, that framework and historicizing it is not a super valid framework for the past. I know. Excellent. And I want to talk about pretty much all of those things um, in greater detail with a really good introduction. Um, Reaction, before we get there, I want to talk about your sources a little. And so Reaction always puts together beautiful books. I love them. Um, And this reader is is no exception. The book contains, what was it, 103 images, 100 in color, I believe? Something like that. Yeah, all but four or five are in color. Yeah. And um, uh, images of such like variety and depth that using the old, uh, the cliche richly illustrated, like way undersells this book. Um, and I want to bring this up first as an entree into like speaking about your sources. What kind of material do you, do you use for this study? Um, and like uh, loads of images, but that's, uh, that's not all art historians do, right? I want to make sure our audience understands what art historians do. Right. So, I, you know, it, it's tough because um, also when I was because I work a lot on, on on clothing and garments and adornment and things like that. And, you know, I, I think traditionally everyone's always trying to figure out how does this painting match up with something that the person actually wore. Right. And it's it's a, it's not sort of that simple. And a lot of times even figuring out those kinds of questions aren't they don't say that much. They're not super interesting. So it, it really is sort of like a puzzle piece, how you have to fit together together. 
Um, I read a lot. Um, my main sort of written sources probably are ambassadorial documents because there's in, in, in this century, really, particularly around Milan and a couple of other uh, court centers, there's, uh, you know, a, a, as one historian said, um, um, a, a world of paper that there's a huge growing um, um there's a huge growing uh, infrastructure of, of ambassador, resident ambassadors writing letters and a lot of these survive in great numbers. Um, I also look at sort of poetry, at literature of various um, genres written at the time um, and looking also at all kinds of surviving visual evidence. Um, a lot of frescoes in particular, I think like the frescoes of the Palazzo Schifanoia and Ferrara are just, they're so rich in detail that they're very useful for me. Um, but then also thinking a, a lot of times about surviving um, material culture objects other of, of other sorts also. So in this book, you know, I talk about um, uh, falcon hoods that, you know, that survived from the early 16th century or all kinds of sometimes garments and, and other things that were buried with lords that have been um, exhumed and, 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 and restored um, and all kinds of other sort of surviving bits and pieces. And again, it's it's trying to tell a story by looking at all of these different genre and genres and all of these types of sources and not taking any of them as sort of like straightforwardly. They all have their own, you know, biases um, and they all tell us some things, but misdirect us in other ways also. So it's important to kind of like try to create something which can never be entirely, you know, complete out of these sort of puzzle pieces of sources, but always being critical of sources, never, you know, just saying, oh, because, you know, because he's painted like this, he looked like this, right? It's always thinking about these sources that all have, yeah, they're all, they all have their all, they all have their own ideological biases and, and trying to look through them. And as an art historian, really what I'm trying to do is it's less about like deciphering symbols, figuring out what this meant or that meant, but trying to figure out what work art does, how it convinces it. Um, and in this case, um, other lords, and more often also subjects that someone deserved to rule, right? So it's, it's not about just kind of interpreting symbols or interpreting what's meaning, um, but, but thinking about how they, how these images worked really. And I, I think that, I think that's pr produces a more rich art history. And, and, you know, that's something that a, a lot of us, a lot of us art historians have been doing in the, you know, the last decade or so, or, or, or more than that too, which, you know, for, for those who, you know, for, for someone who might have taken art history class in college many decades ago might be something of a surprise. But I think this is also one way that art history and history and early modern studies have, have converged a, a little bit as well. We're definitely um, interested in kind of the same kind of discourse and the idea of trying to triangulate a culture based on all of these random points that don't agree and you can't 100 percent trust. That's but nice. I like that to triangulate everything. Yeah, you can't trust. Don't agree. And yeah, you're not trying to find one answer either. You're just trying to, you know, um, give account for the rich ways that that culture and, and, and art works. And in, in, in more simple ways that that it works. Um, and also uh, the other thing, though, is that uh, uh, this the uh, I want I wanted to point out, like I want to bring up the images in part because of this conversation, but also just to let our listeners know that it, after they read this, um, they should read this before the next time they go to a museum, because like there's a lot about just like understanding what you're seeing that you don't get unless you have this kind of a, a little bit of an education with this. Um, it was really enjoyable. OK, Um so before we go any further, though, I want to have a quick chat. I know it's you're probably tired of it, and because uh, it's such an, a, a massive issue, and it's kind of everywhere. But the idea of using gender as a category for analysis. So, like right now, as we record in late 2023, we're in the midst of a massive kind of ongoing contentious conversation about the nature of gender, and uh, I'm just going to quote you here, actually. Uh, multiple constructions of masculinity always compete for cultural prominence, and any single ideal of manhood is far from monolithic or fixed, but rather has conflicting, overlapping, ever-shifting, and often ambiguous meanings. Theorists of gender and sexuality allow us to appreciate the socially and historically contingent rather than essential or static nature of masculinities, which is an excellent summation of like the state of things at this very moment. Um, I want to know how that works in the past. How did you use that understanding of the current discussion of gender to look at early or look at Renaissance 
Italy. Right. Um, yeah, that's a great, that's a, that's a great question. And I think, yeah, it's a big, and I can think of a couple ways to go. I mean, on the one hand, you know, I obviously thinking about like gender and, and sex today, um, you know, I, I, we are obviously increasingly aware of this into which um, I think gender and sex are both embodied and, um, and also the way that, you know, they're increasingly fluid and unstable. I mean, I, I'm in my mid forties and not only, I would say constructions of sexuality, but constructions of gender and constructions of sex have, have changed a lot. And even in my adulthood. Right. And those sorts of les- lessons are useful for us also as historians. Um, I like looking at the, the past to sort of denaturalize what we take for granted today, right? To think about the ways that the way things are, are not the way that things have to be because they're not the way that things always were, right? And so um, I, I'm also thinking about what the past can do for us, you know, and, and why, you know, it's useful for me. Um, sometimes, you know, even pleasurable for me to think about a time, you know, when men were on display and where, you know, fancy dress and bright clothing was key to masculinity, to, an, to one elite form of masculinity um, and, and, and to power. Um, you know, um, also, one thing I tell students sometimes, right, is the way that, you know, the last president of the U.S., right, dances around at rallies, flexing his muscles to the village people's macho man, right, which is a song by a group of queer men literally dressed in butch drag, right? A construction worker, a cowboy, named after one of, you know, the queerest neighborhoods in the world at the time, right? So, I mean, and obviously it's very campy and camp and, and Trump is not something like we can get into right now or totally, you know, sort of work through. But my point is that we're like, I, I tell the students, there's a lot we're not saying about manhood culturally. And it's doing a lot of sort of, you know, and it's a lot more varied um, and a lot more multiple, right, than we, we, we often think that it is. Um, and, you know, we, we, and students kind of work through this also, that, that they see that there are many different sorts of, um, you know, constructions and, and, and ideals of manhood also relating to, you know, to race, to ethnicity, to class, to, to, to nation, to, 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 you know, time of, of, of their lives, you know, um, and, and we, we, we talk about this, but also the way that masculinity is, it's relational, you know, gender, as we understand it, is, is typically relational, um, although clearly we're, we're, in, in, we're, we're expanding the, the, the relations and we're expanding, ex, you know, expanding the kind of directions that gender can sort of be opposed to or be imagined as. Um, but I would say that absolutely that it's about you know, sort of opposition to, to, to women in some ways, but it's also about domination over other men, right? And, and that was certainly the case um, in, in, in 15th century Italy, in Renaissance Italy, in terms of in, in terms of power, and I think I always want to go back to sort of Joan Scott's thing to do gender history. It's always thinking about power, and that I don't know if I actually say that in this book, but it it, it absolutely sort of underlines you know just being able to say oh this is masculinity or this is femininity or whatever else for the sake of doing that is to me never quite enough. It's always to think about you know it's always fundamental to think about power structurally sort of beyond that. So we had this idea in the past too, just like just like now, that gender is changing, concepts of gender are constantly changing, and that it's constructed in opposition to other things for a purpose, right? That there's an understanding of masculinity that is useful in for for people like there are people in this period who use the construction of masculinity to improve their status. And demonstrate their worth. Yeah. Absolutely. Like this is how, you know, and masculinity in my point and in, in, in the way I'm telling it, you know, and representations of it culturally, right? It's not always about reality necessarily. It's about a representation and trying to conv- convince people. They hear these forms of masculinity bolstered power. They bolster social hierarchies. They proclaim and they promise, right, that people, that men who meet these paradigms of elite manhood, they, that they deserve to be in charge, that the people and the people who don't deserve to be ruled. So it's an expression and a sort of manifestation of, and a means to convince others 
of the way, you know, essentially of power and that those in power deserve to be there. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Fundamentally, you know, hunting um, and, you know, seducing mistresses, but and advertising those things, not only just sort of doing those things are fundamental to keeping the people in power in power. Right. Renaissance rule was always a little precarious. These men were, con- were you know, they were very aware of the, the, the fact that they could either be assassinated by, you know, members of their family or or rival factions um, who were could be aristocratic. Or they were constantly afraid of the people too, that what they called the popolo, that were always, you know, that were were always a little bit threatening, right? And, and you know, they should have been afraid, right? Because these these men were very often sort of brutal, um, you know, warlords and 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 you know, not enlightened rulers as as, as we would imagine. And 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 life was 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 brutal in the 15th century, um, and so with good reason. These the, the these rulers often had. You know, we're often suspicious of the extent to which their, you know, that their 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 citizens could their subjects could rise up against them. Um, and but the way that they could create these separations was through the the constructions and performances of masculinity that I talk about mm-hmm. in in this book. Yeah. So I mean, really, it is. Um, you know, it's safe to say that the, their ability to rule relies upon their demonst- their ability to demonstrate that they should be ruling. And this is one of those facets, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about chivalric imagery. Like, what are these guys seeing around them? Like that and reading by seeing, I mean, like visually and like, what are they reading? What are they hearing that um, can serve as an exemplar of ideal masculinity? Yeah. So it's a lot of, you know, um, a lot of images of, of, of jousting, which they performed sometimes set, you know, with contemporary um, characters or, or historical figures, I should say, you know, sometimes set in literature that they are reading. Um, and traditionally, I think historians until sort of recently have uh, a lot of art historians, I should say, have interpreted this as sort of like a, a sort of fantasy, um, a sort of like a decaying, you know, the, 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 the end of a, of a culture where I want to say it's, you know, actually being rejuvenated in lots of different ways. And it's, it's, it's not really about like Lords barely holding on to power, but it's, it's Lords who are powerful using this to, 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 to dominate. Right. So it, it, it's not like sort of the end of something, although, you know, or they would not have seen it as the end of something. Right. Even, even if certainly things change in the next couple of centuries, um, this is fundamental to, to their power. So it's a lot of scenes of jousting. It's a lot of, you know, showing off armor in different ways, even. And, and I think this is something that, that I draw attention to here in this book is the way that um, portraits of Renaissance lords in armor often are speci- in Italy are often shown in jousting armor. And that's something that we sometimes miss, but that original audiences would not have missed. Right. Um, also sort of, you know, um, being inspired by Cupid. Cupid emerges, I think, as an important um, sort of character and in- inspiration because love is so important. There are all kinds of fictions of of love it, related to rule here, right? That I talk about that power was was in many different ways was was erotic and was expressed as erotic, um, and, and not only sort of sexual, but including that, but 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 more than that too. So what we sometimes might separate as sort of classical versus chivalric traditions also very much went hand in hand. And that was the, the part of the, you know, the 15th century Renaissance for, for these, for these rulers. So they have um, all, the, the, the stories from the classical world that we have, right. These same kind of the God, the mythology, and then as well, chivalric, um, like chivalric romances, like what are we talking about? Yeah. All kinds of you know things that we would associate with like Arthurian legends, but but you know which is not a monolithic group, and you know literally, <coughs> excuse me, which is not a monolithic group. That there are all kinds of related um, stories, related characters. Um, a lot of them based on on Carolingian. That was particularly important in, in Este Ferrara, for instance, and Carolingian heroes like you know Roland and and, and but but expanded beyond that. Um, but then they, they were also um, you know they were they were looking also at, at at all kinds of fighting manuals that were filtered also through some of this literature. Um, but then I also talk a little bit about um, a you know 
I'm interested in, in the books that they were reading as, as men and the letters that they were writing as, as young men, I should say, right? As boys when they're, you know, tweens and teens. Um, and they are reading often these sort of pseudo, you know, these Latin grammars um, that are were understood to be Ciceronian, but weren't quite. Um, but they're, this is how they're learning their Latin, and then they're and they're illustrated or illuminated, I, sh- I should say, with images of of ancient battles. But the ancient battles are are being fought by what we would consider to be sort of medieval knights, right? So th- this is another way that um, there's all, all of this sort of mix and and um, be, you know between these between these traditions, which. Um, we shouldn't separate probably as much as we sometimes do. Sure. Um, so the historical, biblical, um, and these philosoph- philosophical works, there's also like, as you noted, a great deal of just eroticism, like erotic yeah. imagery, like very clearly sexual imagery and embodied sexuality everywhere. <laughs> so images of mistresses, right? I have a chapter on Cecilia Gallerani. The, the famous, I want to call Girl with an Ermine by Leonardo da Vinci, who was, you know, sort of fundamental to, um, to, to the, to power. These, these were representations of essentially of, of male virility, of, of the prince's virility. Um, but yeah, I was really just sort of fascinated by the ways that um, gazes and the way that, that these lo- people, the way that people looked at, at lords and described them was so often sort of over, overlaid with ideas about, about love and about, you know, an eroticism, um, you know, that people would say that they were in love with their Lord. Right. Um, I, I kept find, finding this over and over again. Um, you know, and, and this also relates a little bit to the history of effeminacy, which is um, a particular thing that it doesn't align with our ideas uh, culturally today about effeminacy, but why, for instance, a poet called the Lord of Ferrara, the most womanly man he had ever seen or the most womanly man of his time, because as many women as he saw that many he desired. They talk about these lords as, as, as viewers, men and women constant, but particularly women constantly falling in love with them. Um, right. So that there is this sort of erotics of power. And I think power, like we understand power can be sexy today too and, and erotic, but I think it was very much the case here. So one of the things that I, I want to sort of think about in this, in the, in this book is the way that, um, these courts were very much homosocial spaces, right? And, and within them, it's not always possible to differentiate. And I don't want to differentiate what was sexual, what was intimate, what was effective, right? All of these sorts of things. Um, and there are a couple of ways that I explore Renaissance homosociality. But when I do so, I don't want to say it's either or, you know, chaste or erotic. It's, it's sort of all of these things. And that, that's really how power functioned. It was it's seductive. Yeah, this and and the idea that um, there's the intimate, the erotic, uh, the avuncular, the uh, the fraternal. All of these things exist at once. Um, yeah, and I think this is something that I really began to think about here, and I've been thinking about you know since I read the book is just the ways um, that we separate these in the modern world, and perhaps that that just doesn't work, right? That doesn't work in the Renaissance context. Absolutely. That's, I mean, that's precisely my point. Yeah. You said it better than, than, than I did, than I could. <laughs> well, actually, you know, you just had it pretty well in the book, but it's, it's a different thing. Um, yeah. Which is like this idea, you know, as everybody gets Machiavelli wrong, it's best to be feared and loved. Not once. <laughs> if, if- that's what he, he says. He says, if you can only do one, there's, you know, feared is better, but really what's best is, is both. And I think, yeah, and I think that that's very telling exactly both of how this culture worked and number two, how we sort of get it wrong also. It's not an either or for him. So I loved your chapter on animals um, and it offers an image of Renaissance men who are both brutal warriors and devoted lovers who are both feared and loved, right? Um, and I want to start- It's my favorite chapter. Can I say that? It's my, it is so fun to write. Oh, yeah, With all the dogs and the, the cheetahs and the- the birds and the horses. So yeah, it was, I bet it was really fun to research those two. That makes sense. So my, my first question is the most like actually like infantile of questions, but like what's up with all the dogs? Right. Well, they were, you know, they, they love their dogs. I mean, we love our dogs. They're obsessed with hunting. I mean, and it was, it's amazing the extent to which these Lords always have dogs around them 
you know, there's a lot of things in this book that I think that, um, and this uh, that was sort of like once you start seeing them, you constantly see them. It was sort of towards the end of of my of my research that I read this sort of amazing article by Francesco Borgo on um, on Leonardo's hunting metaphors at, at, at the Milanese court and how Leonardo's uh, hunting metaphors about vision in particular relied on the at the time just absolutely you know kind of second nature. Um, connection or, or uh, cl- um, collaboration between sight hounds and scent hounds, um, and how, and then once I started looking at dogs, I constantly saw them paired and 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 and, and opposed, right? And and you see this, per, for instance, in the frescoes of the the Palazzo Schifanoia, but also in all kinds of sort of hunting manuals and illuminations in them too. That this is just a way that they thought, um, you know, and they you know they they love their dogs, right? There's this. Um, you know, my, my favorite example is is Rubino, the the dog from Mantua, who you know is probably the dog sitting under the um, the, the the chair of the Lord in Mantegna's very famous Camera Picta. Um, that at one point he he went missing from his palace for a couple of days, and then he came back soaking wet. And you know, the ambassador tells the story of this amazing kind of reunion between the Lord and his dog, right? And they had funerals for these animals, and even sometimes you know, we had poetry commissioned for for them, and sometimes even had um had um gravestones made for them. They, you know, it, it's one of the ways that I think that looking at the past, we can also see like how like they are to us. But some of the times, too, how unlike they are in terms of, you know, um, you know, th- th- those who wielded power to this extent. But it, but it humanizes them to see how much they, they 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 love their animals. But then again, they also treated their animals in ways which we would find completely, you know, sort of inhumane today. Yeah. Um, including. We're awful to animals today oh also. God, right. Yeah, so. Of it's not really, yeah. Right. Obviously. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, they're just the lines of like what's acceptable are very they're just they've drawn in different places and understood differently you know um you could certainly although there are people who still hunt with dogs i grew up on a farm where that happened um there are a lot of people who would consider that brutal um absolutely you know? yes and, and these dogs they were companion animals certainly but they were above all else you know meant to even if they weren't actually hunting to suggest that the prince did hunt sure. right so both of those both of those, absolutely. And there are loads and loads of images, like so much hunting imagery. Uh, yes, right. and even with cheetahs, which was something I really got to learn about, and, and really, you know, was was excited about the way that these that these princes hunted with cheetahs. Yeah, talk to us about hunting with cheetahs. Right. Well, um, again, you know, and you know, scholars have talked about this because they they show up in the the, the frescoes of the of Gautzeli's Medici Chapel, for instance. Um, and you see them um, here and there, like very famously, or not, sorry, not very famously, but something that excited me was even the, a painting like Gentile de Fabriano's Adoration of the Magi, which is sort of art history 101. Um, you see, it, I've always known that there was a cheetah in the foreground, but way, way in the background, there's a, when the, the Magi's train is kind of winding around, there's a little tiny cheetah way, way in the distance. And it's not just that he's there, but he is, looking at a deer which is running and he's sitting on the on the back of a horse um on, on his riding carpet and he's about to launch into the uh, launch at it you can just tell by the way that he that, that that it's standing um and yeah so they were trained there were people that were cheetah keepers um sarah cockrum a professor and in, in, um it, it has done a lot of work on these animal keepers that was really useful and and they all very often have the you know they they're they're family members that are sort of passing down this type of knowledge um cheetahs came from um both from sort of africa and from what's now iran um and through various different ways and in, um into italy um often through venice but but not only through venice and they were um kept uh, they were often given as gifts um, you know, I, I was very excited when I found one reference to um, hurdles being set up, and at one point in the court of Ferrara, them them you know being raced, so the cheetahs being raced, you know, like jumping over um, hurdles. So clearly, they were you know these princes were um, seduced by how quick and how fast they were, um, and they hunted sometimes deer, they hunted rabbits, um, but they were they're relatively ch- tame and and. Um, well, you know, well trained. Uh, they're, you know, they're extremely charismatic animals. I think, um, and I, 
so there it's an important part of um of renaissance culture at this moment i think they're they're not called they're called hunting leopards and you know i i have seen um, a lot of scholars sometimes think that these were leopards um but 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 there were obviously the 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 species is, is is cheetah um that that they and, and so there's been I think maybe some confusion about that, but it's it's pretty clear that these were these were always almost always cheetahs even when, when leopards are described. Is there anything there about kind of um, the fact that they're exotic from elsewhere from the east? Is there anything? Does that relate? Absolutely. Yes. This is this is um, and in a the, some of the animal stuff was going to appear elsewhere at one point, um, and and. This is absolutely about sort of like global and increasingly is about global control and can be talked about the way that giraffes, eventually rhinoceros, elephants, um, eventually tigers also are coming and, and lions. We've always sort of been there. Um, and, and I talk a little bit about lions they are important to a couple of the cities and also are, are trained um, more di- a lot more difficult to train than cheetahs, at least in the late 15th century from, you know, from the evidence that I have. Um but these are absolutely about sort of like domination and increasing global control too. Claims for that and the, the image thereof and kind of it's a, there's a, an exoticism there that's hard to, you know, that is kind of seductive and as well. Um, so animals that can be about love and war. And then uh, you write on adultery. Okay. That adultery, adulterous sex was formative, almost an essential component of noble masculinity and sexuality. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, these were all men for the most part who had wives chosen for them, um, sometimes at a very young age. Um, and it was important to always, you know, it, it, the uh, adultery was formative. It was a part of the system here, but it also had its rules that could not be um, that, that could only that could be broken only with sort of um, with to, to, to certain people's detriment. And the rules relate always to gender and always to class as well, too, and, and status. So most of these princes, you know, and I, it would, the best would be to have a legitimate son. Right. Because these princes are always thinking about their family line. And um, but particularly in Ferrara, where there was something like 13 illegitimate rulers in a row, um, and, and, you know, that that um, primogenitor was was very flexible. Right. And the Lord could kind of decide which was the best of the sons to choose. And so it was not impossible um, to legitimize, particularly with with the, the help of the pope, sometimes the Holy Roman Emperor, to legitimize certain sons. So there was this whole, you know, sort of whole um, network of of um, advancing illegitimate children. Right. And so mistresses gave lords the opportunity to sort of to manage this right of course with dangers to to both mothers and children um because of of, of in childbirth and in in the, the early years um the you know the um dangers of all of all sorts it was useful also to have this kind of pool of relatively um loyal but uh, also relatively um disposable children but of course, so mistresses go hand in hand and adultery go hand in hand with, 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 with illegitimate children as well, too. So showing off, essentially, that you could have multiple lovers um, was a lot of times expected out of these lords. Um, there are a couple of princes that, that, that absolutely did advertise these lords in paintings, um, both panel paintings and frescoes, also medals. Some of these are, are rel- relatively well known like Sigismondo Malatesta, others like Pierre Marie Rossi, the, ru- the ruler, one of the lords of Parma, a lot less known, but just multimedia campaigns of images of mistresses showing off in a lot of ways, you know, ideal femininity of, of a certain class, but, but possibly even more than that, um, ideals of virility, right? That he had his wife, but he could seduce other women as well too. And it was just always, what was important was that the mistress was of an elevated rank, but just below that of the wife. When the mistress and the wife, um, if there was a wife, some, and obviously there were their mistresses um, when when lords were widowed or before they were married as well, um, if she, if it was unclear who was most important or who was on you know who was 
either more loved or, or better treated. And that's that's when problems arose. For instance, when Beatrice d'Este and, and Cecilia Gallerani wore the same clothing at court, her family, you know, this was the wife and mistress of Ludovico Sforza, the ruler of Milan, that, that was probably, that, that, that became a real issue. But as long as, as sort of the hierarchy was clear, um, it was important for, for these men to show off their, um, to show off their virility, to, 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 not just to show it off, but to, to practice it, right? Because it did have real useful um, um, outcomes in, in, in these children, which they absolutely depended on. And, and they depended on these networks of, 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 of children, even when they weren't designating one of them as Lord, right? They, they served all kinds of other diplomatic and, and familiar purposes too within the aristocratic networks in Italy and, and, and beyond. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So once again, there's this very, very uh, practical side of having a number of of illegitimate children, but then also this idea that you're demonstrating your virility and your seductive power as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you dedicate an entire chapter to Cecilia Gallerani, uh, better known to perhaps everyone but her mother as the lady with an ermine, <laughs> um, which is painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and you titled the chapter, The Girl with an Ermine Between Men. And it bring up, brings up all these issues that you're talking about throughout, right? Um, and the first I want to discuss is the girl, while well, you're calling it the girl rather than the woman. Um, how... How old is she? Why does that matter? Yeah, there's a real, well, you know, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a culture of youth, of celebrating youth in lots of different ways in Renaissance society. I mean, we, we obviously still have, have this today. Um, and that goes along with, you know, like the, the extent both sort of like men, powerful men in Renaissance Italy were obsessed with and love with having sex with children according to our according you know according to our um categories and that's something that i think i think there's a lot of things that art historians and historians in certain ways um you know acknowledge but haven't maybe sort of acknowledged all the ramifications of and i you know this this study i published something on it in like 2008 or 2009 when i just kind of it, it was a very very slow burn trying to find out a lot of things about Cecilia, looking at the painting over and over again but also in, in the last decade or so, some new research has emerged, which which helped me focus on things. It's unclear precisely how old, um, because we don't know precisely when she was born. Um, she's described as between 10 and 11 at a couple of moments. She was probably 12 or 13 when there's a letter where Ludovico essentially is saying that he's in love with this girl and they're trying to have a, a child together. He writes this to his brother, who's a cardinal in Rome. And he doesn't name her, but he names her brother. And it, it's clear that 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 it's her, um, and you know. So this is a painting that's in Art History 101, that um, or it, it's certainly in like Renaissance surveys that people know. It's one of Leonardo's, you know, maybe not top two or three paintings, but 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 quite familiar to to scholars and to the general public also. Um, and there has been this, you know, dating is always an issue with Leonardo, and art historians have sort of tied themselves into knots to try to suggest that she was 17 or 18 years old when she was painted. Um, and, you know, coming up with all sorts, you know, which is, I, I, it says more about us, right? It was about the society. And so I wanted to kind of like make this case and lay it all out, the extent to which, you know, um, when, that that this was a fundamental, that this love of, of, you know, 12 and 13 year olds was a fundamental part of, of, of Renaissance culture that, you know, we that we need to sort of wrestle with in, in, in different ways. And it's a complicated story to try to like to make that case and to unpack everything. Um, so that's why I think it sort of took, but also to emphasize how powerful and sort of remarkable Cecilia was and how she was operating for her family at this moment too, and how um, you know what what she did with her life even beyond her prince's life, um, and you know a, as a sort of as a poet and as someone who decades later people came to um, and, and were sort of also continued to be seduced by, 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 but by her learning as well too. So how he, how she sh shaped her kind of life trajectory. It's, it's, it's also a fascinating story, um, but beginning in, in, in something 
at a moment, right, in a phenomenon that, um, I, I, you know, I think historians know, but also just um, have tried hard not to really wrestle with. The idea that Renaissance people are having are regularly, like 40, 30, 40 year old men are regularly having sex with 12 and 13 year olds. Girls, boys and girls, boys and girls. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just, it seems so foreign and so objectable. And so just like, Ooh, gross that, um, I think you're right. I think we like try real hard not to think about it, but it, it is there, like, it's there and it's an essential part of the story. And we're not going to get, we're not going to understand, um, effective and erotic, what, what have you kind of relationships between Renaissance people. If we can't like really look at this and say how much, um, the the uh, the culture of youth isn't just about being young; it's also about attracting youth and being like being seductive to young people. Absolutely, yes, yeah. right. And this is another way that you know virility is is fundamentally, you know, exercised. I mean, it's both sort of like a a privilege of it and a and an expression of it. Mm-hmm. And I mean, right. go ahead. No, sorry, go on. Uh, well, no, and I mean, it's just I'm thinking about like how um you know we make these kind of it's it's almost a it's a joke now when old men are with younger women and we talk about how much like money can um can like forgive that but we don't have the concept we the the concept that men could continue to be attractive to young women is alive and well in this period not just it's not just for his money right like right absolutely yeah no it's about yeah you know again power seductive and these princes you know are they're, they're, everyone's in love with them. This is whether or not this is true. This is what people say. Right. And so that's absolutely this is a, a function of that. All right. So we, we got the girl um, that she's very young and that's an important part of the story. I want to talk about the ermine. What is the ermine doing there? Right. And, you know, this is one thing that I think some people might know, but a lot of us don't. Ermine's not actually there isn't an animal called an ermine. Um, I mean, there is, but there's not. Right. An ermine is any one of a type of, 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 a, of a couple of different sorts of mu- mustelids, sort of weasel-like animals, when they're in their white winter coats. So most often they're stoats, but they can be other animals as well. So you'll never see an ermine in the summer, right? Because um, so ermine, it, you know, I mean, it's understood as an animal by us and by them. But at the same time, too, really, it's an animal sort of product. It's, it's animal fur. And so whenever you see... You know, and I, I also want us to think about the way that, you know, they were connected to animal bodies in ways that, you know, you know, we've so gotten away from furs um, that whenever you see, you know, a, a, a portrait of a French king or Napoleon or, or, or not, sorry, not Napoleon, but a, a French king with, you know, the, showing off the white fur with all those little black dots, right? Each one of those black dots is the tip of the ermine tail. So each one of them is a different animal, right? Is a different pelt, Right. So they're showing off how many dozens of dead animals they're wearing. And in this period, you know, furs were generally worn on the inside of of clothing, but they'd always be flipped out a little bit so that you could see what the fur was. Right. The most common fur was squirrel fur, actually, at the time, there. Um, but ermine was um, in a number of cities in Italy was reserved only for the aristocracy. Right. So even though very no one you know they didn't keep ferrets or weasels as pets in this in this period they didn't keep stoats as pets you even can't today they're they're the cutest little animals but they are mean um and even though they never held them like chichilia is holding it they absolutely felt ermine on their bodies the the people like chichilia and ludovico and the people who would have been looking at at this image right that but it was not as of a living animal there's a pun based on the name of 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 of, of weasel or ermine in greek and her name and this is common we see these sorts of sort of word plays and plays of identity and portraiture at the time sort of most famously um uh, leonardo for leonardo his portrait of Ginevra da vinci with the juniper bushes behind her um so th- so there's that but at the same time too it's i think it's all about sort of elite tactility. Um, there's a real connection between her face and the ermine's face also. Um, the ermine as an animal has a lot of different 
um, meanings that relate to, I think, the way to, to, to the way mistresses were understood, or that's sort of one of my interpretations here, that, that relates to the way that these women were both meant to be pure and chaste, but at the same time, they were sexualized as well. Ermans were famous for their fertility um, in, in sort of animal lore. They were also famous for, for their purity. Um, most ermine and, and, and animal lore at this time, and there's a couple examples that I mentioned, including one that was in a book that uh, Leonardo even owned, um, it would, the ermine would give itself up rather than spoil its perfect white fur if a hunter was chasing it, right? Rather than run through the mud or run through dirt, it would stop. So it became an emblem of, 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 of purity and by extension of chastity too. So sometimes they're associated with, with um, Mary, the, you know, the mother of Jesus um, and, and her virginity and, and, and purity. So it's, a mo- it's an animal that means a lot of things and does a lot of work, um, but that relate, I think, both to sort of... Um, you know, um, aristocratic culture in terms of erotics, but also in terms of, you know, the the luxury material culture and the way that she's sort of stroking it, I want to, you know, suggest is something that would have related to that, that people would have felt that they would have, they would have known what it means to have ermine and silk and skin right next to each other. You know, the viewers of the, the, the this painting, because they showed off their privilege by, by, by those sorts of senses in particular. All right. And all of this we know about and is brought home to us by men, right? This whole series is, is, is kind of presented by a variety of different men of different, with different kind of gifts and statuses. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci, who um, was a bit of a celebrity, one could say, um, but then Ludovico Sforza, her lover, is one of the most powerful men of his era, right? And then the Duke of Milan, yes, or the ruler of Milan, eventual Duke, yes. And then she's married off to yet another Ludovico, yeah. Yes, to one of his soldiers. Uh, essentially, once his wife is pre- once his wife is pregnant, and Ludovico, um, he was because his brother was assassinated. He 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 married relatively late. He didn't have a wife as a young person. Like these. This is part of the story of adultery, too, that um, Prince's marriages were often managed for them. It was only when he was almost when he was in his late 30s, which is well into adulthood in, in, in 15th century Italy, um, that he he had a wife. And it was only once she became pregnant that it was sort of important that, OK, the mistress go away, or at least this mistress sort of go away. He, he did have later had other mistresses as well. Um Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. He did have other mistresses as well. Um, and so he married one of, or sorry, she she was married off to one of um, Ludovico's uh, soldiers, essentially, an, an aristocratic soldier. And he and they, the family, um, and the child that Cecilia had had with Ludovico officially was the, the, the son, right, who could possibly be the ruler if, if, if that was necessary was given um, a palace, right? Not far from, from the castle. So it's unclear if he ever, you know, if he ever gave up Cecilia or if he did immediately. Um, Ludovico did seem to be quite in love with his also very young bride, um, Beatrice. Um, but, but yeah, so he, she was well positioned. She wasn't, you know, sort of abandoned by, by any means. No. Um, um, rather, you can make an, I mean, there's a very clear argument to make that her this is she her life is made through these relationships. Being um, Ludovico Sforzo's mistress was great for her. Yes, and so that's what I argue about. You know that you know there was a lot of both sort of material gain for her and her family, um, and also sort of cultural capital as well that she you know built upon throughout the the, the many decades of the rest of her life. Um, which is a lot less well known, um, and I think there's a lot more work to do. She was a poet. None of her poetry actually survives, at least that, as far as I know. Um, but it, it, it might somewhere out there. But I've I've tried to reconstruct what we know about her. And yeah, she did live another couple of of decades and um, with, with her husband, and then beyond her her husband's life also. Right. Um, yeah. It, it's just a very, not such a great place to, to use this. To, it's such a great case study to use to really look at all of the ways all of these dimensions of masculinity are at play. 
Um, and I, God, we've been talking forever and I'm not quite done yet. I'm so sorry, but just one more major topic um, that I want to get to. And, but in some ways, I feel like it's the biggest and most interesting question. That's probably more about me than anyone else. But um, Borso Deste. Yes. So this is the final chapter where I look at Borso Deste, the ruler of Ferrara, who was never married and supposedly never had children. Um, it seems like he might have. He probably did some illegitimate children, but he definitely didn't um, acknowledge them. Um, and he is one of these lords that is famous in his own time and famous now for being very elegant, bejeweled, right? And so some 20, 21st century scholars have sort of straightforwardly said, well, he was, he was gay. He was queer. Um, and I want to question that and, and, and say that that very much could be the case, right? But at the same time, too, it's not the case in that he didn't identify himself as that, right? That That's our category and not his. But to think by, if we think through him, what are the ways that he both, you know, how did he construct his self-image relating to, 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 to sex power and, uh, you know, erotics and, and um, in a very homosocial space, in a space that was, you know, sort of populated by, by men and by, by men and boys, um, you know, in a, in a court where p- power was organized around sort of like the promotion of beautiful youths um, and, and loyalty to the prince, right? And this is the way that he, that, that he you know, ruled Ferrara for about two decades, relatively successfully too, and also managed to, um, to keep other family members from encroaching on his rule too much. He had a nephew, he, he, he usurped the power of one of his nephews, um, who he managed with some of his other brothers, some of whom were, he was illegitimate, some of his brothers were legitimate. He managed to very successfully to kind of keep them all, um, probably by not having children, to keep them all, to keep the peace in Ferrara. And once he died, one of his brothers and one of his nephews, um, there were two, coup, uh, there was a couple assassination attempts that I talk about, two different uh, attempted coups. Finally, it ends up with, with the uncle beheading um, as punishment, the nephew, but then giving him the state funeral with his head sewn back on to suggest that uh, you know everyone got along in, in, in the family. But what I try to do in this chapter is think about histories of sexuality and the ways that Borso sort of managed his, um, his you know, what we saw about him, how he sh- how he showed his power, but also how he sort of managed rule in Ferrara, in town and sort of amongst his family members as well. Yeah. All right. And it's a good place, you know, kind of this like the, the is he gay question, <laughs> which is uh, um, one that people really like to ask. And it's so not the right question on every level. Right. Like, yeah, I say, you know, it, it, it can bring like a lot of pleasure to think about, you know, queer people in the past and to say to, to say this. But at the same time, too, if we think we have an answer to that question, it it sometimes shuts down more interesting questions about what does sexuality do and how do we understand identity then? And what does that tell us about today? Right. Sometimes it's, it's, it's a nice answer, but sometimes it's too easy of an answer. It masks what I think are much more interesting sort of like cultural and social phenomenon um, about selves and power and, and um, rather than just having like a simple answer, um, Right. Yeah. 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 And I, I mean, and, well, and the discussion kind of goes back, you know, I see like there it ping pongs a little or pinballs, whatever, whatever these extremes, like, um, no, there was no gay in history ever. La la la, which is kind of a knee jerk historicist reaction to gays everywhere. Hooray. <laughs> right. like, well, and, and absolutely. And, you know, and I, I'm not discounting you know, the possibility, the probability, I would say for him that, you know, because power is all about these relationships with, you know, in this case, young men. Um, and, you know, they, some of these princes wanted beautiful young men around them. They, they specifically asked, you know, beauty was, but, but being beautiful was, you know, that also, you know, being surrounded by young men was, uh, was part of like, also display generally, right? It was useful not for the the prince doing the looking, but for all of the people who were looking at the prince and their courtiers, right? So, but I'm not discounting one one or the other. Um, and another point I want to make is because you know I think like you know I I I, I talk about 
Okay. One other point I want to make also here is that sometimes when we identify figures in the past as as gay or queer, that we we that we um, tend to um, that we tend to um, kind of feel an affection for them, and, and rightfully so. But these lords also were sort of, you know, um, dominant, awful warlords. They were cruel to their their citizens. And I don't want to sort of idealize a figure too much. I want to keep in mind the way that, okay, even if they were, you know, um, uh, even if they, you know, had sex with men or more or more likely in this case, very young men, um, that at the same time, we don't idealize them too much, that we that we understand that, you know, who, you know, how power worked here and how these men were in a lot of ways, very, very brutal. Right. So I just don't want to over idealize them. I- you, you got it. I got it. <laughs> don't worry. Um, you no, know, that very much that um, that doesn't like they're not some fuzzy gay bear is kind of, I think, what you're trying yes. to get to. And it's important not to lose, and, and it's not to lose track of the fact that, right, you know, wh- where their power came from and where their privilege came from, right? That, that, yeah, not not only to idealize them just because, you know, we might feel like they're like us in the past and, and you know, that they're, you know, that they're, it doesn't make them necessarily progressive, right? According to our, our ideals. Right. We want yeah. them to be. No, and, and not, and, regardless of like what's happening it's not something we're going to recognize as a as like the gay subculture the queer subculture we're looking for right and and hopefully in this this chapter i kind of lay that out precisely about i mean because it it was really useful too for me i mean i think you know we were in grad school probably about the same time and asking super um, similar questions that i kind of had like a eureka moment a year or two ago where thinking about like the late 90s early 2000s in terms of history of sexuality it was all about what was essential and what was constructed, right? And there was this debate in, in early modern studies, I mean, in a lot of fields, art history and, and history in particular. And it kind of dawned on me that the, 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 what was considered to be essential at that moment was what the kind of like late 20th century ideal of, you know, sort of male, urban, um, you know, um, elite homosexuality. Um, and, 25 years later, that's not essential anymore, right? So maybe to, maybe that's a good lesson that that was never essential, right? And that we should be careful that, you know, ab- ab- about it. Um, it. It was sort of, it, it, yeah, it kind of had, it sort of dawned on me that, you know, the, 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 the extent to which, uh, you know, manifestations of sexuality, practices of sexuality have changed, even in, in the last two decades, should allow us to reflect upon, you know, even further in the past, right? And and to be to be careful of our assumptions, right? Because we can only imagine how things are going to look ten or forty years from now, right? We should imagine that they're not going to be the same, right? So, we we, we th- that was a further caution, just even for my own sort of recent lifetime and experience to to be more careful about, um, you know, projecting our own ideas onto the onto the past. Oh, that is such a good thing to constantly remind ourselves, right? That um, just like what people are going to think of us 100 years from now or 500 years from now, they're not going to get it right. And or they're at best, they're going to do what we're doing and try and, and try to come at it. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I have taken up so much of your time. This is a really long interview, but it's fascinating. And I just enjoyed talking to you so much. So this guys, was fun, just- Yana. Thank you. <laughs> This was great. Of course it was. Of course it was fun to talk to you. Um, but I, I, so I've got like one more question I want to say. I just, one more thing. Um, what's next? What are you working on now? Well, right. So I'm co-authoring, um, well, I'm trying to finish and need to very shortly a book, a very short book, um, but I'm excited about with John Gagne, who's a professor, you know, a history professor at University of Sydney on um, Renaissance war ban- banners um, and thinking about material culture war, power, you know, these were things that, this is a type of material culture that people died to, to, to protect. Um, and some of them still survive. And I don't know, in Renaissance studies, the banners that have been mainly um, um, studied are gonfalone, sort of ecclesiastical processional banners. But these were pieces of silk and gold that people killed and fought over. Um, and we want to sort of 
try to tell that story in, in, in a short book. And then I'm working on a, a, a much larger project on the materiality of fashion the, um, in, in early modernity. So some of the dyes and mordants and, and things that went into clothing and, and the wars that were fought over them. Again, to think just about sort of like power and display, I guess, is one way to think about um, my work more, more broadly. Mm. different and in, in new sort of ways in fashion and and textiles that are do not last very long absolutely and they and they don't last very long you know in their sort of beautiful mm-hmm. um um in their in their ideal you know appearances interesting yeah that probably says something about you but <laughs> right. that, that that's a conversation for drinks not this yes. podcast <laughs> All right. Um, Hey, Tim, thanks so much. It was great to chat with you. Donna, this was awesome. I appreciate it. (laughs) All right. We'll talk again soon. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.